We'll also be sending out an index uh, that identifies each section of House Bill 2 by division assignment. So in that respect, Division 3 is pretty lucky because out of the 291 sections, only 28 uh, are likely to be assigned to Division 3. And those are the 28 that I'll go through today. So let me just pull up House Bill 2 on my screen. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. So the first section that pertains to Division Three uh, is Section 20, which begins at the bottom of page nine. And this is one of several boilerplate sections that have appeared in trailer bills for the last six to 10 years. Uh, this is a requirement that the commissioner of HHS make quarterly reports on the status of estimated Medicaid payments in relation to actual costs. This language continues unchanged from the previous biennium. The next section that pertains to Division Three, and fortunately they're all in a block here, is 21 on the next page, which allows the department to fill unfunded positions over the biennium, provided that the total expenditure for those positions doesn't exceed the amount appropriated. So this requires the department to stay within its total appropriation for personnel costs but uh, fill positions that are unfunded as they arise. This language is unique to HHS. Uh, other departments don't typically have this, although I think corrections may have had it at times in the past. Section 22 repeals a couple of programs. It repeals the Congregate Housing Program and the Senior Volunteer Grant Program. These are two programs that have been suspended many times over the last decade, although they were funded in the current 2021 budget. Uh, the Senior Volunteer Grant Program was funded at 750,000 a year in general funds. And I'm sorry, the um, Congregate Services was funded at 750,000 per year in general funds. And the Senior Volunteer Grant Program was funded at 100,000 per year in general funds. So this section, unlike sections in past years, doesn't suspend those programs, it repeals them outright. Section 24 is the cap on county payments for long-term care services. This amount is changed each year in the trailer bill. As you can see on line 22 here, the current fiscal year 21 cap on county payments is 126.9 million. That would go up to 148.9 million in fiscal 22 under the governor's proposed budget. Moving down to section 25, I wouldn't necessarily call this boilerplate, but it is something that's been in the trailer bill since 2012, I believe. Uh, and this is the prospective repeal regarding eligibility for mental health services. And this is one of those items that if the committee has any questions, I would ask someone from the department uh, to come over and explain that. But we can um, delay those until, until the end of this presentation, if that works for everybody. Moving on to section 26, this delays the repeal of the department's exemptions from certain transfer procedures. RSA 917A3, prevents agencies from transferring between personnel class lines, but the department has an exemption to that, and they are allowed to transfer between personnel class lines with prior approval of the fiscal committee. So this would extend their ability to do that. Section 27 is another that if you have any questions, I would ask the department to uh, attempt to explain. This is this pertains to the use of MET revenues uh, that go into the Granted Advantage Healthcare Trust Fund or the Expanded Medicaid Trust Fund. My understanding is that this revenue is needed to go into the trust fund in order to uh, provide payments to critical access hospitals. But again, that's something the department can expand upon. Sections 28 and 29 establish a new emergency services for children, youth, and families fund. 
Uh, there is no funding in House Bill 1 for this, but the, the fund is established here and it's, it would receive revenues from gifts, grants, and donations. So, so I have a question for you, and this is more about um, formatting. I, yep. I, I, I noticed that it had this uh, HB2 has had the standard use of bolding of new language. And, and that's really great because it helps you track changes. Um, <clears throat> section 28 and 29, it, they say new subparagraph and new section, but they don't have the bold. And I'm just curious if there's uh, what, the, what the rules are so of consistency so that I, I know how to really look at this and read it. I believe that's because they do create a new subparagraph and a new section. If they were amending an existing section and changing the language, that revised language would be in bold. Okay, so new subparagraphs, new sections, because it, it identifies them at the outset, those are not in bold. That's right. All right. Well, thank you. I think it looks like Representative Walner also has a question. I just wondered if, <clears throat> I'm sorry, thank you. Thank you. Um, on the emergency services fund for children, youth and families, do we have a, does it correspond to a line in um, House Bill 1? I don't believe it does. It creates a new uh, dedicated account, but there's no funding in House Bill 1. And it limits the revenue sources to gifts, grants, and donations. So there's no general fund or any other appropriation. So if they receive some gifts, grants, or an, some funding, and they, I get, they deposit it in the state treasury, and then they want to spend it, what's their authority to spend it? Well, I believe since this creates a new dedicated fund, dedicated account, it would be the same as the authority for any other dedicated account. Um, what that is specifically, I'd have to look up. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm new to HB2. So, so some of my questions are process oriented. I'm, I'm reading um, this paragraph establishing the emergency services for children, youth, and families fund starting on line eight. Yep. Um, and so there's a legislative language that would be inserted into one of our statutes. Yes. Are we effectively the only committee that's reviewing this language to determine its, uh, its sufficiency uh, or, or or are there any other policy committees involved in, in reviewing this particular language? I suspect this language will only come to finance. There have been times in the past when uh, certain sections in House Bill 2 have been partitioned out and sent to other agencies like Ways and Means, for example. That may happen with a couple of sections elsewhere in the trailer bill. Um, and the committee could do that with this section. Uh, or others if it, if it desired. Um, but my suspicion is finance will be the only committee in this particular language. At the, last uh, at the last chairman's meeting, I sent off sections to all, not all policy committees, there were a couple that were involved, but to most policy committees, I sent off sections that I asked them to review and get back to us if they wanted any amendments. So whether or not they follow through, I don't know. So, so for this particular section, uh, Representative Weiler, do you, do you think uh, do you think you might have sent it sent it to Children and Family Law and D and uh, excuse me HHSEA? I'll take a look at if I can find my list <coughs> who I sent to. Yeah. Um, children, I sent no. I sent page forty three, number seventy four. I don't know if. I did not send this one. Um, Health and Human Services, I sent several pages, but I don't think I sent all this. I had page 21, or page nine, that's this one. I sent nine through 24, I sent to HHS. 
as well as uh, 148, 144. I sent those to H. I sent references to those to HHS. So, but I did not send this one to children. I think children I sent only page 43, number 74. So, so my my general summary of my concern here is uh, I just uh, want to make sure that we're, we're fulfilling our responsibility as a, as a division to ensure that we have an adequate hearing on new changes to statutes and that we're getting appropriate public input um, because that's what, a, that's what a policy committee would do if they had right. time. So... Um, okay, so, and, and as a, in my previous two terms, HB, the HB2 processes were, were pretty obscure to me. I, I, I didn't see what was going on, and, um, and okay, that's my comment. Th uh, thank you, Mr. Ripple. Are there any other questions here by the committee? All right, thank you. You can continue. Okay, and section 30 here on section 30 and 31 here on lines 18 and 22 relate to parental reimbursement of services uh, provided to children in need of services. This allows the department to motion the court to terminate any such orders for parental reimbursement. And again, I would ask the department uh, for more detail on those sections. And this has gone back and forth. At one point, if you had a child in need of services and they were there for a year in, in the Sununu Center, then the parents might be on tap for another 20 years for paying for that $100,000 that it costs for them to be in there a year. Then we changed the law subsequently to say they only had to pay while the child was in there. And of course, they looked at their financial need assessment or financial assessment to decide how much they would pay per month. And so many complained about the lengthy period of time they were paying back that we went to, okay, while the child is there, you've got to make payments every month. But when the child leaves, then you don't. So now we're back again till we can continue to bill unless they come up with a decision to terminate the requirement for that particular family. Yes. And moving on, section 32 is boilerplate language that's been in the last several trailer bills. It prevents the department from changing eligibility standards or benefit levels that would increase or decrease enrollment without the prior consultation of the House, HHS and Elderly Affairs Committee and the same committee in the Senate. Section 33, starting at the bottom of that page, states that any general funds appropriated to HHS that are supplanted by increased federal funds uh, would lapse to the general fund. So for example, say the department budgeted certain Medicaid services at 50% general fund, 50% federal funds, and federal funds came in at 60% instead. There was an enhanced federal match. That difference uh, under this provision would lapse directly to the general fund rather within the department. So I, I have to I have to ask who 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 has reviewed that policy to make sure that that conforms with uh, CMS or federal rules? I'm not sure. I believe this language I believe this language was included by the governor's office. I'm not sure that it's necessarily an HHS request. So, so I, I see uh, Lisa English in the attendees list. I, want, would, I don't want to put her on the spot, but if you think the governor's office did it, maybe we could just ask real quick if uh, the governor's office has reviewed this and it, and it, com, it conforms to um, federal rules and, and regulations. Sure, let me just find her on the list here. Matt Milieu is also here from the governor's office. Oh, okay. I, I didn't see him, I just saw Lisa. We'll bring them both over. Yep. 
Hello, this is Matt. Hello, Matt. Yeah, sorry to put you on the spot. If you're not ready to talk to that, uh, that I understand completely. But if you do know, I'd appreciate hearing. And this was section 34 of House Bill 2 that we have here on the screen. Um, yes, and not section 34. Sorry, let me scroll up here. It's 33. section 33, excess revenue from federal match programs. Yes, I, I would defer to the department um, on this particular section. Um, this did come from the governor's office and I do think there need to be additional conversations during the legislative phase. Um, and I, again, I think the department is probably the, the best to speak to exactly uh, what their potential concerns might be and ultimately whether this should move forward or not. So so fundamentally, my my one question is just: uh, do do we do we know that this active? Do we actively know that this conforms with the federal rules and regulations for their funding? Um, so so let's we can take that offline unless Ms. English wants to take a shot at it. No, I defer to Matt on this one. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if we could circle back with you and again, probably loop the department into these conversations as well to understand, again, the intent and also um, just the potential uh, pitfalls of, of what this section would effectuate. Uh, I'd appreciate a chance to, to bring more voices to the table in that conversation. Perfect. Thank you. So I think we can go to section 34. We can. I'm just going to move them back over into the attendee list. All right, section 34 on page 12 states that no state funds awarded by HHS shall be used to provide abortion services. <clears throat> section 35 on line nine. Okay. Appropriates that one. That that one's been in our laws for a while, right? That's been in HB two for a while. The section, section thirty four versions of this have been in previous trailer bills. Um, it's also, I believe, been removed in previous trailer bills. I can take a look at the history. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if there is an existing chapter law out there that already contains language similar to this. Okay, but but. And again, I'm, I'm just learning to read format since it does, it's not labeled as a, a new section or new paragraph and there's no bold in there that would uh, suggest that this was uh, identical language in the previous HB2. Um, no, not necessarily. It's, it's, it's simply suggests that it's a new section. It's not amending anything that already exists. Okay. So, so uh, kind of in a B priority, could you, could you, Follow up and let us know the history of, of that paragraph, please. Okay. Unless uh, Representative Walner or anyone wants to jump in and say what they know, and then we could just drop the issue. I, I can take a look. I, oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, yes, I was going to say, Kevin, let's take a look at the history of this. Okay. Okay, sure. Section 35 appropriates $10,043,000 to implement recommenda uh, recommendations from the review conducted by Alvarez and Marcel that was mentioned during the department's presentation last week. Uh, the only thing I would note about this section and any other section in the trailer bill with an appropriation is that these appropriations are in addition to anything you will see in House Bill 1. So this question came up previously as to where we would see these, these dollar amounts in the operating budget, and you won't see them because this is in addition to those. Okay, so now I have a mechanical question for you. Um, as we're looking at the, the spreadsheets and the budget briefing book to try to figure out where we might uh, reprogram monies, you know, to and fro, uh, are, 
are we supposed to just have a post-it note that we write to stick on the sheet somewhere? Uh, or how, how do we get a comprehensive integrated view of the monies in HB2 that aren't currently in HB1? What, what I, can put to, I can put together a list. It's quite short. There are only a handful of House Bill 2 appropriations to HHS. Okay. It's the next few sections, basically. That list looked like a spreadsheet, then that would work with uh, my brain. So okay, sure. Okay. Uh, Representative Walner has her hand up. Kevin, it would be helpful when you're putting together that list. Would, is this all general funds, or can we use some sort of federal matching fund for this con consultation? This would be a general fund appropriation. When one hundred percent. Under the existing under the existing section, right when it doesn't state the source of funds, it's general funds by default. Um, that's okay. not necessarily to say that you couldn't use other sources for this purpose, though. Okay, and then represent. Thank do you. Do you have a follow up? No. no I, okay. So okay. Representative Verf, you have a question. I do. Could you just repeat what you said, Kevin? This money is being appropriated outside of the budget. Is that what you said? It's an appropriation that's contained in the trailer bill. Yep. So it's outside of the operating budget. It's not in House Bill 1. It's just in the trailer bill instead. And this is something that has been done for, for many years. Okay. Outside of any budget. Not capital budget, nothing. I'm, I'm saying I'm using the operating budget as synonymous with House Bill 1. I understand that, but it's, okay. not, out, it's, not, out, it's not in any budget. Capital That's budget. correct. It's not in any accounting unit that you will see in House Bill 1. Well, you don't I'm not sure if that answers the question. The capital budget doesn't show up on HB1, does it? No. This would be an operating, an operating budget appropriation. It's just not one that's in House Bill 1. Okay. Why do they do that? I'm not sure. This number might have been settled on a bit later in the process, and so it was put into House Bill 2. I, I don't know the history behind it. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, so said a little differently, just to make sure I understand that, Kevin. Yep. Um, if we looked at the total spreadsheet of the governor's operating budget that we've been working with, Mm -hmm. And we were satisfied that the revenues and expenses were in balance. Then this $10 million appropriated in HB2 would throw us out of balance by $10 million and we'd have to go find revenue to cover it. Well, <clears throat> I'm not sure what the governor's office has done with respect to its um, surplus statement. So they may have been accounting for this appropriation on the surplus statement. And it looks like Matt has his hand raised in the audience. So I'll bring him back over. Okay, uh, let's see if uh, Representative Rogers, she's, she's got a cartoon hand up. That's pretty, that's, that's, that's interesting. You're on mute though, Re Representative Rogers. No, I don't have anything up. Oh, I'm seeing, what is that? Oh, that's my icon. If I put it over your, to a, a, a cartoon hand, that's funny. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, so, all right, so Matt, you're not a participant, but you should be allowed yes, to Yes, thank you, Kevin, and hello again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what I would direct to the committee to, uh, and the LBA will be compiling this separately as well, but if you go to the governor's executive budget summary on page 16, you see the surplus statement for the governor's recommended budget of FY22 and FY23. There is a line in there that is labeled HB2 additional appropriations for 17.8 million. That is the sum of all appropriations that are done through HB2 as opposed to HB1. So yes, we have accounted for those. The budget is still balanced with everything that you see here in HB2. Um, but as Kevin said, it's not tied to a specific accounting unit within HB1. Thank you for that. Uh, Representative Earth has a question that may be for you. 
It is for him. I'm just curious as to why would, why is it done this way? So representative, I'd say there's a number of reasons and all of them for different circumstances. Some of them come to timing uh, of when just the budget deadlines occur and, and ongoing conversations. So that certainly is one instance. Another instance might be if uh, the department would need flexibility between accounting units and that is uncertain during the governor's phase. Uh, of course, there would still be a process for any transfers and these ultimately would need to be inserted uh, into a specific area of any agency. Um, so I guess what I would say is most of these are attributable to timing or just uncertainties that exist in January and February, as opposed to May or June uh, when the House and Senate go through and, and finalize the budget. Hello? I'm sorry, what was that representative? Well, keep, keep, keep going. So is there any reason that we wouldn't incorporate them into at least the, the parts that belong in H HS? You could certainly uh, incorporate them into a specific accounting unit. Um, I think, you know, there's a longstanding practice that some appropriations are done through House Bill 2. We've certainly seen that uh, over the past two bienniums and, and bienniums before that as well. Um, so to some extent, it is the committee's preference uh, in conjunction with working with the LBA to identify the, the best home for these uh, appropriations. But um, I don't know that it makes a functional difference one way or the other. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I don't see any other questions. We can, we can continue, Mr. Ripple. Okay. <clears throat> Section 36 continues the suspension of catastrophic aid payments to hospitals. <clears throat> this is something that has been in the trailer bill again since I believe the 12-13 budget. Section 37 is another general fund appropriation of $1.5 million to provide grants to senior centers or other organizations uh, serving senior citizens. And section 38 is another appropriation of $200,000 to support uh, continued admission, discharge, and transfer event notifications within the uh, behavioral health system. And I would let the department speak to that appropriation. <clears throat> section 39 relates to the 60 bed. Looks like Representative Earth has a question. Oh, Representative Earth, go ahead. So do those last two fall in that same category of things being appropriated in HB2 and not? Yes, yes, they are. And they're included in that. I have the governor's surplus statement up now. <clears throat> and I see where Matt referenced the 17.8 million in House Bill 2 appropriations in fiscal 22. So these would all be included within that number. Okay, so we've hit um, 10, 11 and a half, almost $12 million at least from HHS. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Section 39 relates to the 60 bed forensic psychiatric hospital that was established and funded in the previous trailer bill. That has not been built yet, but this would extend the 17 and a quarter million dollar appropriation that was made in the trailer bill. So that would be non lapsing. Uh, <clears throat> As currently written, it would lapse at the end of this biennium and this would allow that to roll forward. Admittedly, there is a provision here in Roman three on line 10 for a potential capital expenditure. And I'm not sure how that would be addressed in the capital budget. Looks like Representative Walner has a question. Oh, okay, sorry, I was reading. <clears throat> Go ahead, Representative Walner. And then if well, you have follow-ups, just have a conversation. So I was wondering, you sort of just hit on it, Kevin. I was wondering how does this interact with the capital budget? Because don't we have a, um, a top dollar amount that we usually look for for bonding purposes? Um, so if we're bonding over here in Health and Human Services, and it's outside of the capital budget. Shouldn't this, shouldn't this be in the capital budget? 
Well, I'll, I'll leave that to uh, the, the, the committees that determine that. I'm not sure how it would work just based on reading this section because the capital appropriation here is contingent on other things happening. It's contingent upon federal funds not being available, for example. So mechanically, I'm not sure how it would work. And I, do you have any um, do you have any idea what federal funds they might be considering? Do we have any, and when those would be available? I'm not sure. I think the department might have to answer that question at some point. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So this was this is the appropriation from. We had this in the previous budget. It was, and I just want to and clarify. Now it's forward. It is, and I just want to clarify what I said. I don't believe the appropriation was 17 and a quarter million. I think the general fund appropriation was some amount less than that, uh, but whatever that amount 16. was. 16, I remember 16. Okay, um, section one on line three allows that to roll forward for the next fiscal year, for the next biennium. Okay, okay, thank you. I think this is something we should really talk to the department about <clears throat> mechanics of how this is gonna work. So we'll skip over section 40 and move on to- I wanna, I wanna stick a second on the, on the uh, psychiatric hospital. Okay. Um, in, in the military, there were hard and fast rules where you just could not use operating money for capital expenses and vice versa. There were bright legal lines. Do we have something like that in New Hampshire? Or, or is there, is there, uh, there seems to be some discretion about when operating money can be capital money. Well, you can certainly fund capital projects through the operating budget. Uh, there's no restriction on that. There may be norms regarding what capital funds can be used on operating projects for, on the other hand. All right, so you just taught me something. New Hampshire doesn't have a legal barrier between operating and capital funds. No. All right. Are you frozen? Am okay. I? Let's see, moving on to, I think I lost my place here, sorry. it be on 41, page 13. Okay, thank you. Uh, section 41 moves the Control <laughs> Drug Prescription Health and Safety Program from the Office of Professional Licensure and Certification to HHS. And after that, we'll move on down to section 106. Now on this one, section 41, uh, I, I think HHS is revealed, re, um, reviewed bills in the past about like, I think we lost you there representative um, maybe I'm just not close enough to the mic but but HHS I think have reviewed bills in the past on the controlled drug prescription health and safety program and so I'm just wondering um, if uh, this is this should already be in statute, or if something got the uh, ITL by HHS. Well, the program itself is already in statute. I believe the language is, trans is transferred over in its entirety, but it's moved from OPLC to HHS. Can you repeat where it's moved from? Uh, from the Office of Professional Licensure and Certification. So something that Division One would have a hand in as well, since that's where it currently resides. So, um, Chairman, <clears throat> I don't know a lot about. I mean, I don't know a lot about this, but um, have we had any contact with um, the Office of Professional Licensure and with Health and Human Services about this transfer? Have they? 
contacted anyone? Is this something they both agree to? Well, well, we have uh, four hands in the audience, so I think people want to people want to talk. Okay. Who, who who are they? We have Matt, John Williams, uh, Patricia Tilly with NHHS. Looks like three hands. Let's go in the order you just described. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my comment was actually related to uh, one of the last things that Representative Earth had said specific to why appropriations might live in HB2 as opposed to HB1. A number of these items are also designed as one-time appropriations, um, which is another reason why they might appear here as opposed to um, the operating budget, given that they're not anticipated to occur either in both years of the biennium or on an ongoing basis. Good answer. Did you, did you have anything to add on the uh, controlled uh, drug prescription program? Nothing other than that we've worked with OPLC and HHS uh, to incorporate this transition into HB2. Representative Wolner, do you have a question for the governor's office? No, I, I, I would like to, I just wondered about the uh, conversation, had, had the conversation happened between the two agencies? All right, so, so we're gonna go to Mr. Williams next in hot pursuit of your question. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of Finance Division Three, uh, this is John Williams, I'm the director of legislative affairs. And with your permission, uh, Mr. Chair, if I could have a deputy director, uh, Patricia Tilly also join me because I have a feeling if there's some additional questions, she will certainly provide additional clarity and support to the questions. Uh, very good. And as we're bringing Ms. Uh, Ms. Tilly into the conversation uh, and addressing uh, Representative Walner's uh, question regarding the engagement between the agency, we have been working collaboratively with the Office of Professional Licensure for uh, a couple of years now relative to, uh, at a minimum, gaining access to the information. And more recently, in the last six months, uh, on a conversation around where the program should be appropriately housed, particularly given its connection to public health and the benefits to uh, uh, the uh, population that you serve, we serve, uh, around it being housed within our agency. So the current uh, Executive Director Attorney uh, Lindsay Courtney has been wonderful to work with. Uh, they are fully on board uh, with the um, having the your, your, house with your our mic agency. just died. I'm sorry. Uh, and so, Attorney Lindsay Courtney, the Executive Director, is is supportive of having this house with the department, not only because of how it aligns with public health needs. Uh, and, and being better housed with our agency, but also as she's doing an incredible job uh, relative to identifying structures and organization at the Office of Professional Licensure around their board functions, their licensing function, and their regulatory functions, that the prescription drug monitoring program as it currently sits with them doesn't align as well as it would within our agency around public health. Uh, I would also uh, just ask uh, uh, Deputy Director Tilly if she could offer some additional insight uh, around that, but I can say personally, we've been working directly uh, with OPLC on this and they, and they are supportive of this. So Representative Walner, does that satisfy your question? Uh, rep uh, we still have Ms. Tilly that can speak to it. Yeah, yes, th thank you. I would like to hear um, from um, Ms. Tilly about, about the transfer and what sort of input have we had from the Health and Human Service Committee about this? Is this, hey. this uh... right, Ms. Tilly, uh, take it away. Can you do address that? Yes, thank you so much. And again, this is Patricia Tilly from the Division of Public Health Services. Thank you for inviting me into this conversation. So John did a great job of just sort of wrapping up that we have had a a uh, several year process right now of conversations with OPLC and also having policy conversations um, around the use of the PDMP data and how we can best protect it, secure it, 
and use it to inform our public health policy and our behavioral health policy. So um, I think there's a, a couple of, of questions on the books. One, um, we, have, um, we have thoroughly vetted this through OPLC. We, the two departments are in agreement um, that it seems to be a good fit for it to sit here, especially with some of our other business lines of work around handling other sensitive data and registry type data. Um, and then, uh, forgive me, I've, I've lost the last half of a Representative Walner's question. No, I think, I think that answered it. I do have one further question though that I would like to ask. So the budget that um, the OPLC had for this activity will be transferred over to the Department of Health and Human Services? Correct, that's my understanding. And much of that is um, they have some federal funds um, in addition to other funds to run the program. And where would we see that in the, where will we see, where will we see that transfer of um, income and expenditures in the budget? Has it, is it in the budget that we have in House Bill 1? And uh, Representative Walder, I, uh, Mr. Chair, I would defer to either the governor's office to, to Matt and or to Karen Rounds. They probably would be better able to identify where in the operating, bu operating budget that that transfer would take place, obviously from uh, a different division into the division three uh, budget. So I, I would defer that question to one of the financial folks. If, if Ms. Rounds is, is on, uh, it'd be great to bring her in because I'd also just like a detailed question about whether we're starting up a new account line for this um, that we'll see in the future in HB1. Good morning, Chair. Good morning. Did you hear my question while you were being transferred? I did. Uh, yes. The the appropriations are within the public health department, our division rather, um, and they have been transferred as they would have been budgeted at OPLC. So there are no increases. Um, it, it is just transferring those accounting units over to the division of public health. So, so is this in the spreadsheet now or, or, or will, is that just something we have to factor in? Uh, nope, it's going? already in HB1 uh, reflected. Um, it's already there. Okay, fantastic. Is it, is, sure. it, uh, is it is it uh, merged with any other funds or is it its own distinct line? They're their own uh, accounting unit and it's probably more than one accounting unit. Um, and those will be covered when we cover the division of public health. I believe that's the last division we cover a week and a half from now or so. Very good. Representative uh, Weiler has had his hand up a while. Yes, sir. All right, thank you. I just want to point out that this goes on for eight more pages in this item if anybody's interested in the detail. And we should keep track of things where money is transferred into HHS when we compare the spend from previous biennium that we ought to be aware of the fact that this is new money that came in from other parts of the budget and not if we try to make a, a, a total comparison this should be a footnote. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions. Uh, Ms. Tilly, uh, did you have anything you, you wanted to say that we've not asked you? Um, thank you, Representative Edwards. Um, as uh, Karen Rams described, when we do our DPHS review, um, we'll surely have an opportunity to talk more about this at that time. back in the bullpen to keep warming up, stay limber. Let's see. So <clears throat> we're moving on now, moving on now to section 106, which I just need to find here. Not sure what, what page it's on. Okay, section 106 here on page 46 relates to the veterans home and it basically gives the veterans home the same language that 
HHS has elsewhere in the bill, allowing them to fill their unfunded positions during the biennium, provided that their total expenditures for personnel services uh, don't go up or don't exceed the amount appropriated. And this, I need to go back and check. They may have this language currently and they may have had it previously. Um, I think this is something that the Veterans Home has had in the past. Likewise, section 107 provides the Veterans Home with special transfer authority. And this is something that exists in the current trailer bill as well. Let's summarize that. If you could summarize the special transfer authority, how, how, how would you say it in a few words? Uh, well, it gives the Commandant broad authority, as you can see here on lines 26 and 27. Uh, they're, author they're authorized to create accounting units, expenditure classes as necessary to address present or projected budget deficits. So that's, that's quite, that's unusually broad, but it is authority that they've had over the last several years. All right. Thank you. But they still need to go to GNC for approval of those transfers. What, what is a GNC? Uh, Governor and Council. Section 108 also pertains to the Veterans Home. Uh, this, I believe, is new. Actually, they may have had this before as well. Uh, relates to per diem payments and states that. Actually, I need to take a closer look at this one to see if this is uh, to see if this is something they've had previously. Yeah, I'm having a hard time reading it just because I I want to associate the term per diem with the payment to um, a, a, like a a day-to-day -day nurse, a visiting nurse. Mm -hmm. but the rest of it doesn't read that way to me, so I'd have to I'd have to look at it. I may have to take a closer look at these veterans' home sections to uh, see what they do, and also see if they've had these sections previously. Okay. Uh, when when are we scheduled to see the veterans home? They're coming, right? They are last or second to last. I think you may be seeing them on the same day as public health in about a week and a half. Okay. All right. We get, we got time. Talk about, and they can talk about those sections as well as sections one hundred and nine and one hundred and ten, which also exempt them from uh, statutory provisions related to uh, transfers. So that section 110 actually is the last section under the purview of division three. So that's all I have for now, unless the committee has any questions. All right, so I'm looking to see if anyone's got their hand up in the committee and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not seeing any. Um, and so let's, let's give it about 30 seconds to see if anyone in the attendees list wants to raise their hand. Uh, if anyone in the attendee list wants to raise your hand, go ahead. I would just ask you, if you have comments, to speak uh, very directly to a particular section that we're reviewing and that you keep your comments to the policy uh, and, and not uh, the philosophy. I'm not seeing any attendees' hands, are you? I'm not. So, so I think we've successfully done a walkthrough of HB2 and that there's a few outstanding issues. Um, were you able to talk and record the open items, uh, Mr. Ripple? I mean, that's a lot to, to do both. Uh, I think Joan has been keeping track of the committee's questions, so we should be all set. Okay, so before we come off of this, let's do something we've not done before. Uh, um, Mr. Feldstein, would you would you summarize uh, what you have down as open items? You're on mute, sir. Sorry. Yeah, of course, Representative. I have. Um, let me just pull this up here. I have a request from Representative Edwards for the Governor's Office and the Department to provide information on Section 33 of HB2 regarding the need for the provision. Um, I have a separate uh, request from Representative Walner regarding for the department regarding what federal funds will be used for the forensic psychiatric hospital and uh, provide additional information on mechanics with the budgeting. 
And then um, a few requests for us to the LBA um, regarding section 34 uh, of HB2 and looking at the history of that from uh, Representative Walner and then um, for Representative Edwards to create a spreadsheet with funded prov provisions from HB2 not included in HB1. Anyone from the committee uh, think that something got missed? That, that sounded comprehensive to me. Uh, I think Representative Norgren, that was a thumbs up. You're okay or you have a comment? I think she's okay. All right, well, so that concludes this portion of the uh, of today's uh, work session. Um, we're going to meet at one o'clock, uh, but I, I would like to spend the next 30 minutes or so with the committee talking about this work session and well using this work session to talk about future work se sessions. This is probably not going to be of much interest to the public because it's really just uh, um, I, I think the division three needs to talk about some ways of working because uh, I, I don't really have a firm grasp on what a finance work session looks like. I have some assumptions about what it could look like, but, but I think it's important for us to get in sync on, on how we're going to use these work sessions in the future. So, um, so Representative uh, Walner, it looked like you were ready to talk, Did you, or was that just no? Okay. So um, uh, you can you can drop uh, Miss Tilly if you want, uh, uh, Mr. Ripple, and uh, and and Ms. Rounds is always uh, she's sort of our extended team member here. Um, but so what I think of when I think of the term work session. I put it in the context of my experience in the other policy committees where we would have um, executive sessions on bills. So we would, you know, have the type of meeting or hearing where we get public input and all of the uh, uh, reps would ask questions of the people coming in to testify, but there really wasn't crosstalk or debate. I, I, and then they would take a look at that bill in an executive session and determine, you know, uh, the pros and cons and, and then vote, you know, OTP or ITL or some other motion um, at the end of it. Now, I don't see us doing a lot of voting, but I do see us needing to have uh, interactive conversations with each other that are open to the public. So they, you know, the public is aware of what we're thinking and, and why. Um, and, and so, so, so my overall concept, and I'm asking you to clarify this so that I know what we're doing, uh, is to, is, does that sound like a standard work session in division three? And, um, I, I, I didn't see which hand went up first. I'll, I'll go with representative, uh, uh, Weiler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. What we've got to do is, is find out how much of the revenue is, is going to go to the HHS. And that's complicated by the fact that uh, we just saw a transfer from OPLC into uh, HHS, which should be counted as, as new revenue, I don't think. And then um, one of the things we've done in the past, especially in the Senate, where they were expecting a, a grant and it would come through fiscal, they took it out of the budget completely to make it look like it was less. And we are also aware in many of these um, programs that money is coming from federal, federal grants, but we don't know exactly how much, but many, many of these grants are like three year grants. And if this is the first year of the grant coming into this budget, then we can assume that the other ensuing years will be about the same amount. Uh, that isn't always done. Sometimes they don't put a figure in because they say, well, we're not sure, but it's within a small percentage, depending on what other states are doing with those grants. So it's, it's not much variation from what they're getting for the first year of the grant. So we, we need to take account of all those things. Then we need to make some tough decisions of where we save and go back through and see uh, each person will want to identify targets. Some of us are going to get a lot of 
feedback from counties on reducing the county caps. Uh, it's, it's a huge increase for counties to, to uh, struggle with it from three the typical 3% to 18% increase. So we wanna look at those things. We wanna make some decisions. We wanna have to have, to have uh, Kevin keep us well apprised as how much, how much we can spend versus how much they wanna spend. Those are going to be tough decisions. So that's 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 going to take most of our work session, I think. Thank you. Walner, did you did you want to help me understand the concept of how we use work sessions? Well, I, I would say that you know I've been here, I've been on finance a long time, so I've, work sessions have been done in a variety of ways. It seems to me that one thing that you need we need to do is, and people have done it in different ways, but is to get focused on the areas that um, we either have more questions about or people feel that um, there needs to be, appropriations need to be different than what, what the governor has proposed, but we need to start sort of whittling it down. We've actually done it in ways where We've gone through, Kevin probably remembers doing this a few times, go through every page. And if the page looks good, if we, you know, as a division, we um, think the page looks good or the uh, program looks good with the funding it's got, we'd put a check mark by it. We could always go back and revisit, but um, it would get us so that we could focus in on the areas that we had the most questions or we needed to take a look at the appropriations or the staffing or whatever it was in that, in that area. But unless we do that, unless we, we need to find a way, I think, to get focused on certain areas of the budget. I mean, some lines are, some areas are really big and we haven't gotten even to the big ones yet. I mean, when we get to the Medicaid lines, we're really into very large item, very large items. So, so let me let me um, drill down in your comment there. I think it was very useful, uh, and I have a segue to, to to say how I think we might do that focused effort. Uh, Mr. Ripple, could you uh, pull up and share the Excel sheet that you sent this morning that that shows FY eighteen and nineteen? And and I'm not going to ask you to justify it. I'm just going to have people look at it, make sure they got it, and. I'll talk to what I'm doing with it. Sure. Just one second here. Representative Nordgren, you took your hand down. I assume it's because Representative Walner said what you wanted to say. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I... Okay. So this is as good a place to end up as any, but. But um, okay, so so what I ha have been asking Mr. Ripple to do, and what he's delivered to us, is is this a, is a very similar view of the governor's budget um, as we have in our in our budget book. This is like pages three, four, and five um, in soft copy and extended, so that we see what actual F FY eighteen and nineteen were as well. And I, I've been asking for this because I, I, being new to the committee, I particularly need to see a longer historical tale so that I can tell what, how we're trending. And so, um, so what I'm, I'm going to be doing with this, could you scroll down to the bottom of child development program, the DEHS, just, it's, a, just, it's almost right there, right there. Okay, so, so what I've been doing uh, as of this morning, is going through and looking at the year-to-year -year percentage growth in each of these line items, um, and uh, and particularly where the 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 amount of money is considerable. Taking a special look at that, like for example, if I had done DEHS in the client services field operations. It would, it would show that we went from 11 million in 18 to projected 13.5 in 23. 
and, it, and, and there'd be a year to year growth there. Now, that would just be data that would indicate whether or not this is an area we want to drill down. But I, I'm, I'm a very top down structured thinker. You know, it's how you design software, it's how you do a lot of things. But that's how I think. And so I, I, I am proposing that we use this sheet so that when we get together in work sessions, we can uh, highlight at the higher level the, the areas of, of concern that we have. And, and this can trigger us to go deeper into the budget books uh, for information and to ask questions. So that, that's, that's basically how, how I see us doing kind of a top-down structured uh, uh, review and uh, assessment of the governor's budget. Uh, Representative Walner? Well, I think the history is, 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 for this sheet, is good to have the history. I do think, though, you need to be going back at some point and looking at the, at the pages and at the programs, because even, I mean, even these lines are comprised of a lot of different, a lot of different things. So if you want to be specific about a line that you think is over budgeted, you can't just, you can't just reduce the bottom line. You can't just reduce the total. You need, you may need to be specific about how you want that reduction to happen. Oh, oh, sure. I'm, I'm you're just, just going to do a flat old back of the budget reduction. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm just, I'm just trying to describe a top-down way to maintain focus. I, I'm, I, I would not at this level start recommending cuts. Like for example, what I might do is on line uh, Excel line twenty-seven. Uh, briefing book line 47, where it says APTD grants, kind of just, I would, would look at the trend and look at the numbers and I'd go, okay, that one's probably okay. That's not one that I really need to drill down into immediately. I, that would be something I'd look at later. But, but then uh, as contrasted with the client services field operations line, that, that, that looks like it's going up five to 8% per year, which is higher than the rate of inflation. I'd, I'd probably, and it's a significant amount of money. It's 13.5 million by the time it's the budget's done. That, that would probably jump out at me as one area that I'd want to drill down deeper to understand it. Even at this level, I wouldn't say let's cut that because you got to dig into it to figure out what's in there, why it's trending that way. But this is sort of, to me, uh, almost like a radar system to where you can see the, the major pings in the budget for where we need to focus. Did, did, you, did you have a comment there? Um, no, I just think that we're going to need to go back and to the pages and look at more specific information. Um, I mean, for instance, if you take, oh, I'm trying to look at an, an item that that does increase. Okay, so the client services, I mean, there's a lot of things we need to find out about that before, I mean, we might put it on our radar, but we there's a lot of things. For all we know, they became responsible for a lot of other things in the department that they hadn't done before. Um, I, so we, we really think, have to drill down into those numbers. I, I think we're in violent agreement, but okay. because you've been doing this for 24 years, and I've been doing it for 24 days. Uh, it's sort of like you have a PhD in this and I'm in the, <laughs> no, the, freshman, the freshman introductory course. I, I'm, I'm explaining how I'm viewing our process and hoping that it, it fits with, with where you're at. And, and so uh, Repre Representative uh, Nordgren, did you, you had your hand up here. You keep coming in and out. I... Well, Mary Jane is covering a lot. Um, yeah, I think what we need to do is finish all the work with every department and then go back to these and then pick out where we want to go to the budget book. So I think that's really the process 
for the next, I think we need to set a timeline with our calendar so we know exactly where we are when we get to the point of finally making the cuts and, and going to those pages in the budget book. Okay, that's a good comment. Let me, let me say a couple things about that. One, let me verify that you've received the calendar of for March from Mr. Ripple showing sort of each day of the month of March, the things that we're going to do that day as a committee, because that's a nice overview. So is that the one that we got weeks ago? Well, and then he updated it when we moved uh, things around this week. So, so the most recent update was like towards the end of last week, I think. I Mr. Have, Mr. Ripple, I could you send that out again? Just to make sure we all have that. Sure. Yeah, I don't remember getting that. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I, I liked it so much I cut the relevant portion out and I've taped it to my desk. So it's, it's sort of like my day planner. Um, yeah. Um, and I, I, and, and I, I absolutely agree with you as well that, that uh, we have to be getting into the detail in the budget book before we can intelligently think we should in, add money or cut money. Right. So um, you recommended that we continue as we have been, that, that, because that was the other question I wanted to ask. Now that we're sort of halfway through, do we like the way we're going through the budget with the, the, the department presentations followed by uh, the Excel sheet and, the, and, and in between the uh, budget book items. Is that, is that, do we still like that consistent approach and should we continue that with the remaining departments? Oh, just, Representative Nordgren. Yeah, just a comment. Um, I, I wish we were using the briefing book more. Um, I think when the department sends us a huge package to look for the next, to look at the next day, it'd be much better if we could send those out sooner and we could use them along with the briefing book to get ready for that uh, presentation. But um, one of the things Mary Jane and I talked about is in the future, it'd be good if the briefing book we got in the first place contained all those presentations. So we could have everything in one place and not get you know one the night before, but that's just a procedural issue. I, I think that's good feedback. And, and I, I suspect uh, the department would have a reason for telling us why we're getting things in the sequence, we're getting them in the timing, but but I don't want to assume any of that. Uh, Mr. Mr. Ripple, uh, do you want to speak to that or, or Ms. Rounds? I know I know that you're sending us stuff as soon as you get it. As far as why the calendar was set up the way it was, it was simply a matter of uh, the, the schedules that worked for people and and how much time we thought needed to be allocated to each area. There wasn't necessarily any rationale for the sequence other than that. Okay, but Representative Nordgren is suggesting that she would like to have the presentations earlier and during the briefing time that we have. Oh, I see. I, I think she's asking that more emphasis be put on the briefing book pages because uh, that that's material to the way she looks at uh, the budget process. Okay, I, I think that's something that uh, that could be done going forward. With, with regards to the presentations, if you don't mind, Chair, I can speak to yeah. that. Um, I, it, it's truly a time constraint issue. There, there's a lot of competing demands on the directors and, and so preparing those several weeks ahead of time it is very difficult from a time constraint issue. So that's, I, I assume I, your priority is that budget book that that and, and, and so you put all your effort into that and then after the fact people work on their presentations using historical documents and modifying it a bit. Yes, yes, me the priority definitely is the budget briefing book that takes 
several months to put together. We started that back in November, December. Um, so that is the priority to have those done. Um, and of course, as you all know, the directors have um, other competing priorities beyond the budget too. They actually have work to do. Um, <laughs> they do. Yeah, so- And, um, and double work with COVID, unfortunately. Okay, so, so, so I think the, the short answer, Representative Nordgren, is, is I, uh, I think we're going to try with the departments to have us spend more time looking at the budget books when the departments brief us. And we'll see how it goes because I put a lot of time in these presentations and so they're kind of hardwired into those. And I would say that most of the presentations do incorporate everything that we say in the briefing book. The briefing book is really meant to be a resource that as you start to review and try to make decisions on, on reductions or increases that you're able to go to that accounting unit in the briefing book and be reminded exactly what it is um, just in case some, there's not somebody from the department available or you're working on it you know, off time um, that, that you have those resources available. But um, we can certainly you know, talk about them in the presentations to the extent that people have questions. Thank you. Um, so, so Mr. Ripple, uh, I'm looking at the the March calendar you put together for us, yep. and uh, what I'm not maybe it's on here, but but could you tell me our drop dead date where Division Three should expect to have its work kind of done to for the overall finance committee to absorb our work. Yes, the divisions, let me just pull up this calendar, but there is, the divisions need to have their recommendations in by, I believe the 26th. So I currently have the 24th as the final day of work sessions, but you could go uh, until that Friday. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm just looking at the words in the calendar you sent, the words say budget slash bill work sessions. Yep. But this one is an important one because this is this is what you think it should be our planning drop dead date, even though the 26th is our real drop dead date. Uh, it, it would be ideal if the committee could get all its work done by the 24th, but that doesn't always happen. So, yeah. I, so, yes, the short answer is I had planned on the 24th, but you do have an extra couple days. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna write a note on on my desktop that says we're gonna try to a, a plan drop dead on the 24th, and then we're really dead on the 26th. Yep. Okay. So th those are those are important dates for us all to have in mind, and uh, I'll I'll try to work out some thoughts on where we can be with the work sessions that are already anticipated in here. So uh, Representative uh, Weiler, you've raised your hand. Yes, uh, I wanna remind you that he puts the 24th, uh, all our LBA people are putting in 18 hour days and more, and no weekends during this budget time period. So. You know, he's got to get everything perfect. He's got to have other people cross check his work. He's going to spend some very long days making sure he has everything perfect as well as all the other LBA in the, in the other divisions. So try to be sensitive and make sure we get it ready so he doesn't have to work 20 hour days and getting ready for the presentations to the full house and the, and the public. So uh, that okay. So, so I think that's a great comment. And, and let me come back to you, Mr. Ripple, and say, I'm, an, I'm assuming you've built in some time to sleep if we get our work done on the 24th. I have, I have. And we will have time to do uh, data entry into the budget system and all that over the weekend. So there, there, there's time built in for that. All right. so, so if you need this, to be the 23rd instead of the 24th, you'll speak up. I will, but the 24th should be fine. 
So Representative Nordgren, you have your hand up? Yeah, I was just looking at the calendar here on my phone and it looks like next week we would only meet two days. Um, I'm questioning whether the house will be um, having meetings maybe on town meeting day. Um, that's not in our calendar, but I'm not sure we can't do virtual that day. I also um, am unsure about the three different house sessions on the 11th, 18th, and 25th. Um, uh, that's not what I've heard this house is doing, but I don't have any communication with the speaker. So um, I just would maybe check on that because um, I'm worried we're really going to end up with some long days at the end if we um, don't do Fridays and we and we think we're having house sessions. Thank you. Okay, so let me take that last part first, uh, the house sessions. Uh, what I knew was, what is today Tuesday? What day are we? It is Wednesday. Wednesday. It's Wednesday. It is. Oh, so, okay. So, so, so <laughs> welcome to our world. So uh, Monday or Tuesday, the speaker was going to be working with uh, the sports center to coordinate schedules. And so I'm expecting any day now, any hour now, for there to be a plan for when we're going to go back into house session. I think, I think what Mr. Ripple probably did with these Thursdays is just put the house session question mark for us to just know that maybe we want to stay away from scheduling those days because um, we may end up having the house session scheduled that day. I, I, don't, I don't think we're going to have more than one or two days at most in March for a house session. That's that's what I'm hearing. Uh, Representative Weiler, do you want to comment further on potential house session days? Well, I'm also thinking of a full committee session days. There's been some bills passed on to us. Most of them ended up in division one. When they get to them, they're going to have to come back before the committee and have a vote, have them forwarded onto uh, the house to, for a house session. So even though we haven't, as far as I know, gotten any of the bills that were passed this last session, some of them did go on in division one, which will require us to have a full session day at some point. Maybe we can do it in a half a day, but we'll see. Thanks. You want to tentatively um, put your finger on one of the days in March where we may have a full finance committee day? Or is that, I don't want to put you on the spot either. Well, I'll have to get together with Lynn over and see how she's coming on fitting those bills into her schedule. And when she okay. thinks she'll be done. Okay. Very good. And then uh, Representative Nordgren, I recalled that you said two things that I wanted to follow up on, and I did this last one first, the House sessions. Uh, well, the, the, other, the other question is um, the town meeting day next Tuesday. Yeah. I'm unsure if the House will still what be... What a town meeting day is. So I need an education. What is a town meeting day? Voting. Oh, oh, I get it. Our towns. Our towns have meetings that day. I get it. Right. Yeah. Okay. But I don't know if that's a day we need to take off, if there are people who are going to be involved in that, or if the house as a full body is taking it off. I Just because of this virtual, I don't know. I, I plan on anticipating. I See, I have three towns, so I'm going to try to get to at least one of them. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, you'll have to go vote, but it's not like any of us are selectmen or, or uh, registers, of pro registers of the checklist or anything that would require us to spend the whole day there. Uh, quite often we have that happen, but I don't think any of the people uh, speak up if anybody is involved in town where they got to be there at the polls all day. So that's just how I figure out what's going on in my town. And, and well, People grab me and talk to me, so. We're penciled in for uh, o'clock on the 9th. No, wait a minute, that's another division. All right, so we're not penciled in to meet on- no, We are not. On the 9th. No. Do you, wanna, do you wanna pencil something in, in the afternoon? Either morning or afternoon. I don't think we have to have, we don't have, to have the whole day off, but you know, it's up to you. <clears throat> 
So, um, I did not make sense to look at the Fridays before we look at that particular day. I was trying to reserve Fridays. Um, okay. I, I don't. I don't know. It just seems like people are working on the weekends and giving them some time to work on Friday would be kind of good. But um, would you rather do a, uh, so? Oh, that so sense. that's. Mary Jane, do you know when the Gopher meeting is on Friday? I'm sorry, uh, Representative Weiler, I have not heard what time it is. Yeah. I figured that they know they have both you and I to, <laughs> to schedule around, I hope. I hope so. So at least they maybe let us know a little bit further in advance. So. Yeah. The other thing that you guys are involved in is that joint fiscal committee, I think, and, and, and I'm not sure when the next one is, but those tend to be Friday mornings, right? It'll, it'll be the ninth, uh, 19th. 19th. So, so Mr. Ripple, if you could just add that as a, as a note, since it's putting demands on our committee. I have a thing on the 12th, I just realized as well, having spoken up. Okay. <laughs> All right. No beer for you. Fair enough. Uh, okay. So, so, so let's, 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 uh, uh, Jess. Sharon has a question. Oh, there it is. Yes, go ahead, Representative Norton. No, I, sorry, I didn't get my hand up. Sorry, I opened a can of worms. <laughs> no, it, no, it's all good conversation. I think I think we're 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 smarter as a committee as a result. So so um, I think what we've done is we've added a work session <clears throat> on Tuesday afternoon the ninth. So that needs to be a, a calendared item. And then what is our last hearing? Our last hearing from the department is scheduled for the 15th. Is that correct? Yes, it is, public health. Okay. Now, now so that already includes a continuation of public health. So, so that's, so we're probably good, right? Do you, do, you, do you have any reason to for concern that we don't have enough department days scheduled? I think you have enough department days scheduled and I think with five work sessions and the possibility of opening up and opening up the afternoon of the ninth and possibly Thursdays and as well in which there are no house sessions, I think you have enough time to do your work. Okay, so just keep in mind, everyone on the committee, uh, I, I, I'm trainable. I, I don't know exactly what I'm doing, but I'm trainable. Talk to me uh, if you yes, see something. MJ. I, I, see, I, see, I see her, but I was in a sentence. So, Representative Walner. On the 9th, what time do you think you'll come in and to work, and how long do you think you'll work? I Because it looked like we... We're empty that day. That day, I scheduled something for that afternoon. So I'll tell you what. what what's your preference? I, I I think if we got together for a couple hours, given that we still have division uh, that we need to hear, just I I just want to make sure that our 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 ways of working together are coming together, and maybe two hours of 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 talking and working with each other will be useful just to learn. So so what what's your pleasure? When, could when we come you... in? Could we come in at noon and be done by like three, two thirty to three? I'm okay with that. Are there any concerns, vetoes? Do you have an issue with starting at noon, Mr. Ripple? Nope, not at all. I don't know what your union contract says. Whether I need to send you a sandwich if we do that. No union. Okay. All right. So so we'll go from noon to three and. Honestly, I don't. I don't think we'll need all of that, but but we'll see. Uh, I would like to tell you a little bit about <clears throat> a conversation I had uh, with with some folks about <clears throat> the revenue estimates. As you know, um, we've been talking about. Uh, an $80 million shortfall overall in the biennium between uh, the House Ways and Means revenue estimates 
and what the governor's budget anticipates. And as a result of there being a, a, about it, I guess it's more precisely 77 million, but, but in any case, <clears throat> Ways and Means is projecting revenues and, and we're seeing a shortfall between that and the governor's uh, budget. Um, we're getting feedback that the governor office is very confident in their revenue estimates, more confident than they are in the ways and means estimates. And, and so, um, so while we will be looking for ways to tighten the belt, if we, in, in case we have to, um, the governor's budget or governor's people won't be participating with us to a great extent. So, so we're going to have to do some path finding on our own, looking at potential reductions so that we're ready if uh, the worst case starts to appear. Um, but, um, but so I wanted, I wanted to open that up and let you know that that's where we're at. Representative Weiler. I have a lot of faith in, in the methods that the Ways and Means Committee has used for the past two or three budgets, and they have been very close. Uh, and we have, of course, put the budgets with their revenues, and I don't think we've regretted it. Whereas if we went with the governors, I think we would find ourselves short. So I think that, you know, within our own family, if you will, they're part of the legislature. They're the ones that are responsible to giving us, and, and that's, that's the pattern we go with. Ways and means comes and tells us this is what we think you'll have. They may come back and later in March and say, "Okay, we can add another ten thousand. But and then the Senate it goes to the Senate in March and April are such key months, and the Senate gets to look at them. So the Senate may come back and say, "Okay, we've got another twenty or forty or fifty million." And if that's the instance, then we ought to be able to say when we put things aside. The priority is on this one that we just cut. That's that's the highest priority to put back the money in there. And then this is the third, and this is the fourth priority, and whatever. But so we can go to them and negotiate it and say, you know, okay, you had more money than we did, but we think you put it in the wrong place. We want to wish to say that rather than put it there, you would, should have put more here and more here, and so on. So that that's one we keep in mind when we do a force to make cuts is prioritize where we'd restore. That's the way the game is, and that's the way it's been going on for years. And I think Mary Jane can agree, and, and Sharon Nordgren would say this. that's the experience. We Thank you. Uh, Representative Nordgren? Yes, um, I would just want to stress that the Ways and Means Committee, and Jess, you can talk about this, will come to uh, another discussion about revenues um, in a few weeks. So before we finish, and I don't know, if you either you or Representative Weiler know the time frame, um, which might be helpful, I so we, on which day we might get new numbers. So go ahead, Representative Weiler. I think you had an answer. I, I don't. I don't know yet when we'll hear from that adjustment by Ways and Means. They would probably want it as late in the month as possible, so they could get they get to look at the most parameters, but. Yes, they will give us an adjustment <clears throat> along the line. And if, as I say, if we've made priorities on, okay, we cut here, but that's the one we least wanted to cut. So that's that's where we'll put the money first. So that's, that's the kind of thing why we want to keep track. Thank you. So, so could we go back to the uh, Ways and Means chair and, and say, um, on the 24th of, of March, we're trying to, be all done with the division three, we would like you to give us your best guess as of the 23rd. Give us, give us your, your, whatever you're thinking on the 23rd, whether you're going to look at it again in a week or two, but just tell us what you think on the 23rd. I'll have a conversation with him to that effect. Okay. I mean, all right. So that would, it seems to me like that would lay out a logical sequence. I don't know if ways and means is, could accommodate it, but I, I, I hope they could. I mean, if nothing else, they would say, 
you know, whatever we voted in last session is still their current estimate, you know, but but if they're thinking something different, it'd be good to, to get an informal update, I think. There might be some key report and maybe the data that key report would, would trigger the whole thing. So I'll have that conversation. Thank you, sir. Um, okay, so, um, so I, I, I think I'm done saying everything I wanted to say. Is there, uh, for the good of the division, does anyone have anything uh, they want to talk about that has not been raised? And that, and Ms. Rounds, that includes you. Oh, I do have one more thing for you, Ms. Rounds. You know, a, a couple of times as we were going through the department's increments and decrements list, I, yes. I made a, a comment that sounded something like, you know, I, I understand your concept, but, but we need something measurable to go with this so that we, we know what we'd be getting uh, if we add or subtract. And, uh, and, and uh, in other words, I was looking for more specific metrics associated with a 5% increment or decrement than what many of the slides were sharing. Okay. Do you know if people are working on giving us better metrics around the increment and decrement list? Yes, if it was on the follow-up questions list, which I believe it was um, that Jonah provided me, we, we are working on that. I know at least Chris Santanello is for DEHS. Um, so I'll make sure that, that if it's not on there for, for Katya for behavioral health, that we do um, add it on there, Jonah, so that we make sure we get it to you. And I'll mention it to the future presenters as well. Okay, I know we've asked for a lot of things, but as we're as we're just kind of taking a look at the big picture here, that the details on the increment and decrement list are really going to be important. Understood. Okay, all right. So um, I'll try again. Anything for the good of this vision? Anyone? Uh, let's do one last opportunity for the attendees to raise their hand in case somebody's got something to, to make us a smarter, better public servant. So I'll give you about 20 seconds to try to figure out how to raise your hand if you're an attendee. Okay, I'm not, I'm not seeing any. So I don't think we need a motion to adjourn, uh, but I'm, uh, I'm ready to adjourn. Are there any vetoes? Anyone want to keep going? All right. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Ripple. You had one last thing or were you just saying goodbye? So you did plan on coming back at one for the last of the presentations from. Oh, the yeah, yeah, yeah. One o'clock. Yep. So I think you would recess until one o'clock in that case. OK, so this is a recess until one o'clock. Thank you for okay. the clarification. Sure. All right. Um, the establishment of the 10 year plan, uh, mental health plan. So I like that graphic and someday it might be interesting to put uh, sort of your best estimate of population numbers in each of the bubbles. So we have some, uh, another sense of, of how, how big an issue we've got. That is a really good point. We um, talk about numbers in our briefing book. Um, and so the, we always have that issue of how many do we actually serve through the publicly funded system and how do we capture or quantify those who fall out of the um, department's purview, so to speak, for funding of services. But at the very least, I think you can refer to the briefing book, which does break down uh, the numbers served in uh, a number of these categories. So you can see, um, and, and we've talked about this previously, um, both with the New Hampshire Hospital presentation and um, on Monday about the increases that we're seeing in the people who are seeking services. So the good news is they're engaged in services and the bad news is we're seeing a, a increased demand. Sure. Um, so, so this number 15,763 or 33, um, it, those are spread out amongst those five bubbles or, or is that in one particular bubble? So 
that is not, so let's just go back and look. So those would be the ones who are more likely to be in the top three. So the three to the right. Um, so those are the ones we use that data from the community mental health centers. And so that is where the provision of those types of services uh, happen. So outpatient treatment, um, not so much the step up and step down, but um, the crisis and inpatient services. So, um, so yeah, you know, community education, as always, that's, we think of it as population education, population health, and that is as broad a category and harder to capture. Thank you. <laughs> So this goes, breaks it down a little bit. You saw this on Monday um, for children's behavioral health. It does it by eligibility category. And again, shows the same uh, level of increase in each of those categories. And I'm sorry, it's hard to read that slide. I'm realizing either that or I need to put on my glasses. Okay, that's a big number of serious. Yes, it is. And um, we're, you know, we're prepared to go uh, talk to you about what that means. There's a definition that's in um, law and it's um, also um, commonly used and part of the um, everyone's definition, federal definition of what severe mental illnesses and what severe and persistent mental illness is. So this uh, really talks about what the responsibility of the Bureau is in overseeing the provision of these services. I would be remiss if I didn't recognize that I'm not sitting here just uh, representing the Bureau, but I'm also representing the dozens and dozens of community service providers who are actively working um, today um, to address the needs, as well as the thousands of individuals who need our services. And so we break it down, you'll see community mental health centers, um, as we talked about um, on Monday, there are 10 centers uh, situated um, in geographic locations throughout the state. Um, you all have them in your uh, districts then hopefully you know them. And if you don't, um, it would be great for you to connect with them or them to connect with you to talk more in more detail about the types of services that they provide. So they have the outpatient services, emergency services. We have the mobile crisis response teams we talked about Monday, and those are for adults. And they include four respite beds in each of those three regions, which include Concord, Manchester, and Nashua. And that is the program that we want to integrate and expand and have um, all populations served and have it uh, be a statewide system. So, so are all the mobile uh, systems uh, under this uh, budget line area? So, hmm. That's a good question. I think I will have to ask Jane to answer that because I think we have the mobile crisis that are currently in existence are in our um, current budget and carry forth, but then dollars were added um, to expand. And I believe that we had dollars uh, uh, put into both the Bureau of Children's Behavioral Health and this particular bureau. And Jane, could you just validate that? Yes, yep, you're correct. There is money in 4117, our accounting unit here in mental health. And there's also money in 2053 in the children's behavioral health section. They broke up, right? I'm sorry, you didn't hear me? Uh, I, you started, I heard, I, I heard you up until you said the first half and then I couldn't hear you after that. Okay, so there's money in uh, the accounting unit 4117, which resides in mental health, which is where we're at. And there's also money in 2053, which was talked about on Monday in the children's behavioral health section. 
Okay, so are these mobile crisis? Like, I'm sorry, uh, I thought you were done. Uh, that's okay, go ahead. Um, so are these mobile crisis teams, are they uh, significantly different from one another to where one has a more of a pediatric bent to it and one has a more adult bent to it? Or are they sort of uh, like Swiss Army knives and can handle any psychiatric crisis? So thank you, that's a great question because going forward, we're going to have it be all encompassing um, and that's what we're working to put in place right now statewide. Right now, these three particular teams are um, comprised as uh, laid out in our community mental health agreement, the Amanda D settlement, um, which we um, work with closely with the plaintiffs on overseeing and uh, maintaining component of that um, really dictates, and it was agreed upon, what those teams would look like and who from a um, certification and professional standpoint serves on those teams, including peer peers who serve on those. Um, each of the three um, areas have taken somewhat of a um, slight, slightly different approach um, however, they stay within that main framework in the agree that's called for in the agreement. So while Manchester may um, be able to respond to children, the other two are unlikely to do that only because we fund them to support the adult uh, population. And again, it goes back to that underlying um, agreement. The specialty services, there's residential services, REAP, when I saw that I'm like, oh no, there's an acronym we didn't spell out. So that's Referral Education Assistance and uh, Prevention, and that really serves the adult population. Um, and if anybody, well, you couldn't have been, but um, this morning on the exchange, they talked about this uh, program specifically. It's for individuals who are in um, congregate care as well as in the community, and it is um, for adults 60 plus. So we have deaf and hard of hearing services and first episode psychoses. And that FEP is how we refer to that. That really is trying to provide that early intervention when someone first experiences a mental health crisis, acute crisis. And then the last one is a grant, that, a federal grant that we have, um, ProHealth Integrated Healthcare for Youth, um, specifically targeting that particular age group, which we talked about again on Monday. And that is looking at integrating um, physical health and mental health services together. So um, there are community mental health centers that have partnered with their federally qualified health centers to really provide the, what we all would like to see is the integration and not have separate um, services or separate approaches for mental health and for physical health. The next uh, there's a question there with the representative Nordgren. Thank you very much. Um, I'm particularly concerned about the North Country. Um, could you address any um, programs or new availability of services up in the North Country? Obviously, the three units are really right where our population is, but I think the North Country isolation, I think, is a big concern to a lot of people. Thanks. So you're going right to the heart where my heart always is, which is the North Country. I have an affinity um, for that area, knowing um, the challenges there. However, we do have a statewide system. Um, so the Community Mental Health Center there has the same level of services as the rest of the state. The mobile response teams specifically were targeted because of the volumes and the, util um, the utilization um, as determined through that period when we were settling that court case. And so it was um, negotiated and determined that those three areas were in the highest need from 
uh, a numbers count. We have worked really closely with Eric Johnson from Northern Human Services um, to look at his um, population differently due to geography. So while we have assertive uh, community te um, treatment teams, um, so those are called ACT services, and those are high intense services for individuals um, needed at that level um, ongoing. Um, he, we have worked with him so that he has uh, more than one team. So while the other centers for the most part have one team, although Manchester is the exception to that, um, we've worked with um, Northern Human Services to make sure that they had geographic coverage so that nobody um, is stuck um, in Littleton um, needing to seek services in Conway, for example. Um, but it is something that we monitor very closely and um, we know that um, that is an area that we need to continue to work on. Thank you. So the middle one about housing services, I think everyone is acutely aware of the housing crisis that we have um, in the state of New Hampshire as evidenced by um, the individuals who are homeless and by just the tight uh, real estate market that we're reading about every single day. So these housing services are specific for individuals with severe mental illness that are in need of more support than, um, so transitional housing, they need more support than just um, having um, a place to sit, stay, so to speak. So we have specialty residential, transitional housing. Um, many people are aware that we have transitional housing run by uh, NFI. We're bringing up that acronym again. Um, here in Concord on Pleasant Street, um, where the state offices are. We have other um, beds that are in housing programs that are available in a couple other parts of the state. And we're standing, continuing to stand up additional um, programs. The Housing Bridge Subsidy Program is more a traditional um, approach where we're able to provide a so-called voucher um, to an individual who qualifies. And this bridge and the whole point of a bridge is that it is someone who's eligible for Section 8 housing um, however, they are going to be waiting and waiting and waiting for, to receive that Section 8 housing subsidy. So we bridge that time between when they are in need of housing and when they're going to be able to secure that federal uh, Section 8 housing. So um, there are currently, um, we are in contract for 500 apartments for uh, leasing up. Um, we have many of those individuals uh, come from New Hampshire Hospital. And so when Heather Moquin was speaking about needing to find the so-called back door and needing to work on that, I think she a couple times referenced to bridge, the bridge program. Well, that's this program. And with that program, the eligibility is um, determined um, with the community mental health centers and by our bureau. And the, there is a, a sliding fee scale. So we only pay, I think it's $689 a month. Um, and there, you know, that's not gonna go very far in the Seacoast probably, um, or anywhere right now. So we do have the ability to waive that. Um, if someone has an income, then we, all, we pay only a portion of that. And so I'll pause what, there. What question? Um, help, help me put 500 apartments in context, because I know we have a very high um, occupancy rate in apartments. So it feels to me like 500 statewide is a, a really significant percentage of our uh, vacancies. So this program um, goes back a dozen years or more. And um, it has been very successful in the way that it's been administered in the development of relationships. Um, so it's always been 500? 
No, it just increased by 75 slots due to the funding in the last um, budget, um, in the last biennium. We were just able to go to contract to increase by 75. We are- Okay, all right. yeah. so that's all right. I, I, I thought it was a bigger issue. I thought you were going to take 500 more new units. And, so uh, you're just, just taking 75 more to get to 500? So up to 500, yeah. So okay. administer, a, I just want to- uh, Rep Res Representative Walner has a question. Oh, sure. So, Akaji, I don't know if this is a good time or not for you to talk for a little, a minute about the community mental health agreement. Sure. Um, it was sort of what, I mean, I, I don't know, I don't, I need a refresher as to what all was in there. And I do know that the expert reviewer reviews us on a regular basis. And I wondered how, how we were doing when I looked last time, it seemed that we, there were some areas that we were still um, not, not quite there yet. So could you, when, when the appropriate time, uh, if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, on this slide, um, there are a lot of uh, things here that um, are um, the backbone of the agreement and what we uh, are standing up for services and have stood up. So the housing bridge is a perfect example of that. Um, it called for an X number of slots to be available that we were to achieve that. And we were given a ramp up period over three or four years. And so um, I believe that 500 number now um, exceeds what was in the agreement. However, um, the agreement also indicates that we would seek additional funding if a wait list were developed. And um, right now the wait list is relatively manageable, um, but we know with the um, way things are going and with, with New Hampshire Hospital having trouble with that uh, back door that that that's an area that we need to focus on. So the premise of the suit was that New Hampshire was um, unnecessarily um, institutionalizing individuals with severe mental illness um, due to the lack of community services. And so um, we were, uh, the lawsuit was filed by the US Department of Justice and the Disability Rights Center and um, there's another organization that's also involved. Um, and so we were able to come to an agreement. Um, it was funded in a special session. I believe it was 2013. Um, we started getting some funding for this. It was a uh, um, off budget year. So that was difficult, but we were able to do that. And the components of it is really looking at community-based services. So um, who from, New Hampshire Hospital doesn't need to be there um, if but for um, the community services, if they, if they had access to community services. The other population that's addressed is the Glencliff home. So you heard uh, Todd Bickford talk about Glencliff and um, we were obligated under the agreement and were successful in transitioning 16 individuals out of Glencliff home into community-based settings. And there are a lot of um, details about the definitions um, and I'd be happy to share the agreement as well as the latest expert reviewer report um, that was just issued in June, at the end of January. Um, and so it has major categories of what we need to provide in services, including housing, including those three mobile crisis teams, including a number to have the capacity to serve 1,500 individuals statewide for um, the assertive community treatment, which I indicated before, which is that intensive service. Typically someone who is on an ACT team um, needs ongoing long-term support and intense services. And those are likely to be individuals who are transitioning um, from New Hampshire Hospital. And that capacity is one area that we continuously struggle with in not having um, 1,500 people who have, um, we haven't achieved that number of serving 1,500. We've been hovering around the same amount 
for several years and we've had discussions about whether there really is the need um, to build that much capacity or if other types of services um, would be um, appropriate to serve the same individuals that would be served by ACT but at a different, um, a different service level. Your hand is still up. Do you have follow-ups? Uh, no, I, I want to I want to thank uh, Katya for that. And if it's possible, I I think I know I would like to see the agreement again. And I don't have it. I my, uh, right here on my desk. So <laughs> I'm sure you do. Too. So <laughs> maybe, maybe other people would like to see it too, so you can sort of read through it to see what the uh, the state's responsibilities are. So I think that falls under our general way of distrib distributing documents. Yep. Mr. Ripple catches them and make sure we all have them. And if appropriate, it gets hung on the LBA website. How, how, how long is, are we under this agreement, Ms. Fox? Is it forever? Okay. Or yeah. Until we achieve um, the, all the components and come into compliance. And so it was originally envisioned to be five years. It's now been um, closing, I think it's been six or seven years. Um, I think it was, um, I can't remember if it was 2013 it was signed or, or February of 2014. And I have to pull it out from my pile. Um, we um, have, we've gone past the five years is the bottom line. And we continue to have that expert reviewer monitor um, for a number of things, including um, an expectation around quality. Um, and we will only um, not be under the agreement when we achieve the goals and um, come into compliance. And then it's monitored for one year that we maintain that for one year. And so we're in it for a while longer. I don't see any more questions. You can drive, drive on. Okay. Peer recovery. We talked about this with um, the um, individuals with a substance use disorder. This is also a really big component of the mental health system. We have eight agencies that have 14 locations that are in each of the regions, those 10 regions around the state. Um, again, these are lean organizations that have some paid staff, but many volunteers as well. And they um, are trained and um, they have um, office hours. So they're, they're in-person um, drop-in centers and um, they um, they're a key, like I said, a key component. We have family peer support um, as well, um, so that we can assist families as they try to assist their um, loved ones. We have the inpatient. So all of a sudden we're skipping, we're going from one level to um, the acute level. And so in addition to New Hampshire Hospital, New Hampshire Hospital is designated um, as a designated receiving facility. So those beds are known as DRF beds. We have community-based DRF beds, and those are located in Manchester at Elliott Hospital and the Cypress Center, which has, um, that's under the uh, Mental Health Center of Manchester. We have in Nashua, we have them, Franklin, Derry, and Portsmouth. And we're um, frequently looking to expand that, um, though, that number of beds. And then the other um, is guardianship services. If you recall in, on Monday, one of my early slides was talking about the need for 10 additional slots in you questioned uh, that it was only $30,000 as a prioritized need, and that is indeed the case. Um, so that's that service. And again, those are guardians that are appointed um, to help individuals um, with basic life skills. 
and overseeing their finances and medical care. Okay, so that's everything I remember from the guardianship. I don't think I asked you how many clients can one guardian uh, service? Ooh, so now Julianne gets to be on camera if she knows, but um, I do know that we have contracts um, with two um, agencies, organizations that, and one is, um, the office of the um, public guardian. Um, but Julianne, do you know the answer to that question of how many they serve? I know um, we can get that if, if you don't have it. It's not urgent, right? Yeah, it, it, as you said, it, it's under their contract. So we contract them for a particular number of slots, but I don't have that information right in front of me. But we can follow up with that. I'm just looking through my my notes to see. Um, I mean, I'm just thinking aloud, you know, that that's got to be one of the uh, most cost effective. I don't know if it's clinically effective, but it, it, it or the extent to which it's clinically effective. But that sounds like one of the least expensive ways that we can help our clients. So I do have a little bit of information that I used. Um, to flip to the page. So the per diem payments for guardians is $8.25 and um, in one contract and the other is $6.81 and our caseloads, um, and this includes for individuals with an intellectual disability as well. Um, our caseloads for state fiscal year 20 were 1,035. And we expect um, in, uh, to, that to increase by about 2025 in this uh, fiscal year. And I will say this is an area that we often have to transfer funds because we're obligated to provide these services. And um, so, so we're always um, looking to find funding to be able to cover that gap. So this really just gives a, a coverage map for the mental health region. So um, again, probably can't see it, um, but um, you can blow it up on the, um, on the screen with your individual um, documents that were uh, shared with you via email, I believe. So we have 10 uh, community mental health programs. That, that's what the map covers. Um, we have a community mental health provider that's the aforementioned NFI. We have the eight peer support agencies with 14 locations around the state. We have the family mutual support agency, which um, is uh, Ken Norton's group, so NAMI New Hampshire. Um, we have the suicide prevention line, and I know this was raised, I believe, by Representative Norgren on Monday about the funding that went to Headrest. Um, so that was the first time in uh, the last biennium that was funded state funds going for the suicide prevention line. Um, and so we have $200,000 that we contract with Headrest to provide that service. We have the designated receiving facilities that we talked about. We have the legal services that we just talked about. And then we have some technical assistance training that's provided to um, all of our providers and in some cases to the community. So let, let, let me do a, a quick time check. Um, I, uh, how long do you think you need to? Uh, Representative Edwards, I think we, we couldn't really hear you there. Oh, I, I'm, I'm have, I think I am having some internet problems, but um, uh, I'm just curious on a time check. How, how much time do we need to adequately address these slides? I, 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 it, it, in the back of my head, I think somebody on the committee said they needed to leave today at three o'clock. And, and, and I don't know if I'm just confusing that with Representative Wallner tomorrow or, or what, but, but does, does, does anyone have to leave 
prior to three o'clock? I show a two thirty uh, meeting with with the LBA. Yeah, I think I think there's a two thirty meeting with Mike Kane that you, Representative Edwards and Representative Weiler, plan to be in. Okay, so. Uh, and then I have to present testimony at two. So, so Representative Earth, if you'll get get on deck to to take over chairing. Uh, but uh, I, I, if 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 we could move through the slides just a little bit faster, you're doing great, and I'm asking you a lot of questions. So um, I, I realize I'm part of the problem, but but let, let's try to go. Yeah, and um, I can pretty much guarantee that we can talk about this any way that you'd like um, and certainly be finished um, in the next half hour or so, depending on questions. I could talk about this all day, every day. Um, so, um, so if you need to, just start waving at me and tell me to move on. So the key accomplishments, um, this is looking at the expansion of the system where we got um, the opportunity to invest in the 10-year plan. So the 10-year plan was established and then we received the investments. And so we were able to do many of these uh, items that you see listed here as a result of that opportunity. So we added the um, DRF beds to the system. Again, always looking to do that, um, to expand those beds. As you know, um, today's wait list, unfortunately, hit that 60 uh, number that we were fearful of. Um, and so we want to expand those services. Um, and we're in the process of um, procuring for additional step up and step down uh, beds We've added um, beds for the uh, peers, uh, the peer agencies are running those respite beds um, and, and so on. So we're, we're looking at expansion there. Um, we have the crisis response system. You've heard about that previously, about what our vision is with that, with that hub uh, serving as the central portal and then working um, in the regions to have the crisis response. Um, this is really important because uh, Ken Norton from NAMI raised it and I just want to put a little emphasis on it. 988 is the federally designated phone number for suicide prevention. Um, and as Ken talked about, we'd love to see that encompass and be all encompassing for all um, mental health services and be able to collapse those dozens and dozens of numbers so that individuals and families have access to one number similar to what we know for um, COVID response right now is 211. So we were able to um, apply for and receive a grant um, and it's a planning grant to get ready for that 2022 rollout. And we um, have funding that's available to Headrest. And um, so we'll be contracting with Headrest to really do that due diligence with planning. And that includes planning with um, the Department of Safety around 911, what happens when a number comes into 988 and it should go to 911 or vice versa. It's coordinating with 211 and other um, hotlines and um, parties that would be interested in making sure that, that we're really taking into consideration um, how people access um, services. So we also, in the budget, in addition to that $200,000, um, there was funding set aside for suicide prevention that was um, pretty wide open. The Suicide Prevention Council asked us to hire someone and establish a position within the department to be the suicide prevention coordinator to work really closely um, with the council in carrying out its mission and its strategic plan. And that person is going to start um, in, I think, next week or the week after. Um, so we're able to establish that. And then we've also been doing a number of trainings and um, working on a statewide campaign to really get that information out there that there is help um, and that um, people don't have to struggle alone. <clears throat> so 
So again, um, we were able to move the bridge subsidy program from one administrator to the community level. So the community mental health centers um, were very excited and we were excited that they took on the ability to work locally with the landlords in their communities to be able to help the individuals in their region secure that housing. So this type of housing is not, you go to a big building um, that is for all individuals with severe mental illness. This is really integration into the community and finding apartments and working with landlords um, so that they understand um, the value of um, being able to provide that type of housing um, and knowing that the Community Mental Health Center is providing that support to that individual. And then again, a focus on peer supports and um, making sure that peers are available to individuals and not just having a clinical approach um, to crises. And workforce, 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 we're gonna keep bringing it up. So um, under key challenge, oh, I should pause, I'm sorry. Oh, there's uh, Representative Nordgren, yes, question. I just want, <clears throat> wanted to make a bit of trivia comment. Um, headrest was started um, in uh, 1969 by students in the ba basement of a Dartmouth dorm. So it goes way back to that genesis here on campus at Dartmouth. Just trivia, sorry. Were you part of that? Were you part of that, Sharon? What? Were you part of that Dartmouth basement group? No, no, <laughs> no. We, we moved here in 72. Right. So key challenges. Uh, and a significant program that we've been able to invest in. It was basically um, very underfunded and doing a lot of work. Um, and now um, is being able to grow to meet the demand. Um, so we're pleased about being able to partner with them. So again, back to the challenges, affordable housing. We've talked about it, we know about it. Um, the Council on Housing Stability that was established by the governor and of which many um, housing providers and community service providers um, sit on. Um, is looking at this and looking at specific populations, including the populations that our division serves. The workforce, again, um, this was discussed previously and will continue I'm to- Sorry, can, can we go to the next slide? I, 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 I would like to keep us moving. And these challenges are, are we've, we've talked about these before and they're indeed serious challenges. Sure. So now this is the um, budget chart and I believe Karen um, chimes in here and Jane can as well if you have questions. Sure, so the, um, the changes that I would mention here, the, the decrease in federal funds was the end of the uh, DISRIP, DISHP waiver. Um, so that's what the reduction in federal funds are there. That waiver ended 12-31 of 2020. Um, so the federal funds are less. Um, the increase in general funds that you're seeing are the 10-year mental health plan that Katya has been, I'm sure, talking about. Yeah. I, I think we have um, have access to that 10-year mental health plan um, already. But yes. if we could uh, put a link on the LBA site, uh, Ms. Ripple, would that be convenient? I, I, I saw you say yes with your head, so, okay. Um, yes, we, we can do that. What, what else about this slide, Ms. Rounds? I don't think I have anything else, though. It's pretty, those are the basic reasons. Thank you. I, I don't see any questions. And I think that this is probably something you want to skip over, too, because you've seen this, some of this, um, uh, about what we would be able to do with... Um, 5% more and what would happen if we um, go 5% less. Um, I will point out that we are always concerned about making sure that we have 
the funding necessary to carry out the requirements under the community mental health agreement. So, so like, for example, on the decrement where you say a reduction would necessitate, necessitate a reduction of non-Medicaid billable services, yeah. are you also implying from what you just said that it could cause us to be out of compliance with our agreement? It could. Um, many of the components of the agreement require general funds. So housing is not something that we can um, bill Medicaid for. Um, there are some services that can be, but actual bricks and mortar and um, the leasing of that um, apartment, so to speak, um, is not something that there's any other funding for. Okay, so, so my, you, you know my general comment on this, the, the more that this is understandable in terms of measurables, the, the more useful it is to the committee. So, um, so I like, for example, the third pull it down on increments because you start to talk about actual staff numbers and what they do. But if you could help us further by, you know, what, what does improving compliance mean? What, it, uh, that doesn't, that doesn't say much uh, and tangible, I mean. I mean, I know what you're getting at, but. So you will see that, um as part of the 10 year plan refresher that um, you're going to have the link to that there is a huge emphasis on that quality. Um, so that's the improving um, the quality piece, but also the compliance in that um, when we uh, share with you the expert reviewers report, you'll see where we are out of compliance. Very good. And there's the staffing. How are you doing with vacancy rates? We'd like to know about those too. Yes, we currently, I believe, um, we have four positions that are vacant right now. Um, we are very fortunate that we have been given the green light to go ahead and fill positions. And so uh, uh, some of them have already throughout the division have been posted um, and will be posted within the coming weeks. Um, and again, that just takes you know, that time. So we had this period of time where we didn't have enough staff to take on all of the challenges, um, but it will be a ramp up time for those staff to get up to uh, speed. Unless we do what unfortunately has been happening a lot lately, people are moving within the department. Um, so then there's always a vacancy um, left behind when someone moves into another position. So it's a great opportunity for our workforce because they're able to see a career path. Um, it does create challenges when we have those openings come up. Yeah. Okay. And then I think you'll like these benchmarks. Um, maybe they resonate a little bit more than um, the previous ones that we shared on Monday. We're actually working on providing you a more comprehensive response at your request. Yeah, I like the quality metrics. It looks like that's where the, the best work is. You know, the, for example, the processing housing applications, that's a workload measure. You know, I, I, is there some standard of how many applications you want to fulfill in a given month or something? I, that's, that's where that's going. And this slide is a long-term project where we can communicate to each other over the long run. This isn't fix it now. This is, you know, we're having a conversation about future conversations. Right. I like that. And then again, turning it over to Karen and Jane as needed. Patty, if you want to stop sharing, I will go ahead and share my screen. In. If I had, if I could do this one more time during uh, the house phase, then I would actually remember that. <laughs> All right, so the first accounting unit we're going to start with is the Pro Health New Hampshire grant, which is on page 1122. So, so this is a good place for me, I think, to um, turn it over to Representative Erf as, uh, as our vice chair to go ahead and chair the rest of this. And I'll come back uh, after I've given my testimony, Keith. 
Okay. Are you, are you ready? I don't. I don't mean to just dump it on you, but are you I was ready? born ready. <laughs> I like it. All right. Um, uh, thank you so much, um, Ms. Fox, and, and I'm sorry I'm missing your presentation, Ms. Jackson. But it's going to be on video, so I'll have some late night viewing. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Representative. So for the Pro Health Grant 2340 is the accounting unit, starts at the bottom of 1122 and continues on to page 1123. This is one where we've moved the contracts from 102 to 74 for that tracking purpose. Okay. All right, the next one is, um, Accounting Unit 4113, which is Consumer and Family Affairs. Uh, that starts at the page of 1123 and goes on to 1124. Is this where Katya said the mobile units were? Uh, I don't believe this is where it is. Could, when you get there, just remind me of that where they are so I can put them in the right place. You don't have to look it up right now. Just when you get there. We will get to it, yep. That's fine. The next accounting unit is accounting unit 4114, which is guardianship services. If you remember correctly, there was a small prioritized need here for about $30,000, um, I believe only in fiscal year 23. So a question here that it looks like things bumped up. Yes, we, we had to increase the contract quite a bit. Uh, so I'm gonna say it was like early summer, late spring. And I think Katya can speak to why um, we had to increase the contract. So I'm, I'm going to defer to Jane if needed, um, but we did have to increase it because the rates were increased um, by the court system. So they set the rates and also, um, as you heard from some of those numbers I gave you, it's a, a pretty low amount. Um, but that, um, again, we're always running short and we don't wanna run short in this particular area because um, as Jane knows, we're always trying to find um, other funds within the division um, to transfer to this. So we wanted to fully fund it this time around. Thank you. Anybody? Oh. Okay. The next account, uh, county unit is 4115, which is commitment costs. Oh, I missed that one. And this, you'll see that there's an increase in line 550, but you can see that our actual expenses for 2020 are far in excess what's budgeted for 21. This is another area, um, Karen and, and the group, that we are often trying to find money to transfer it because we don't really have a lot of control over how the expenses come in to us. And this is um, the legal services. These are the individuals, um, the attorneys who represent individuals who are under an involuntary status and they're appointed counsel. So we have attorneys who represent these individuals. Any other questions? Here's not, go ahead, Karen. The next accounting unit is 4116, which is interim care funds. It's at the top of page 1126. It says we are level funding with fiscal year 20 with what is budgeted. I believe this is, I mean, it's a fairly small amount, but it's one of those things we never know for sure what the utilization is gonna be. So we just level fund um, and obviously lapse or sometimes transfer to those other lines that are short. We're good. The next accounting unit is 4117, which is CMH or Community Mental Health Program Support. Uh, this, if I am correct, is where those additional uh, mobile crisis 
Um, units are? Teams are, yes, thank you. As well as the most of the 10 year mental health plan is within this accounting unit. Do the most believe, go, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, I believe the appropriation for fiscal year 20 was closer to fiscal year 21. Um, Jane, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the appropriation was a little closer to the to the 28 million. And this is one of those areas that there were new funding, there was new funding and COVID uh, and the contracting delayed our ability to contract those funds. I see Jane nodding her head, so. Okay, yes. Right, so those funds didn't lapse, so they carried over into 21. That's true. You mean that's why the 21 number is so much bigger than the 20 number? No, that, that number wouldn't reflect the carry forward. That was the level that 20 was funded at as well, or fairly close to that. Right. I guess it didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. So the 2020 column that you're looking at is actual expenses and the yeah. 2021 is an uh, adjusted authorized budget. So what Karen was saying was the 2020 actual expenses are a little bit, well, quite a bit lower because that was when we were trying to get the programs ramped up. The budget for 2020 was actually closer to the $27 million number, but okay. we weren't able to spend all of the funds and they um, carried forward this accounting unit um, and that line item has a um, budget footnote that allows us to carry the funds forward within the biennium. This 28 million does not reflect any carry forward. Do you happen to rec recall the 2018-19 numbers relative to these? Uh, I don't, but it was it was would have been quite a bit lower because the ten year mental health plan was um, funded substantially in the twenty twenty one budget. Okay, that's what I thought. So I'm just yes. wondering, given that there's still a pretty good bump going into the next biennium as well, is that we explain how that was accounted for, and I just didn't hear it. Um, so it looks like it's about uh, nine hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what the increase is there. So we can provide that level of detail. It's to carry on the services that are being put into place today. Okay, thank you. I'll see the other hand, so I might as well continue. Okay. The next accounting unit is 4118, which is peer support services. And that is a pretty good jump in general funds too. Is that? It looks like uh, Jane and peer support that we're no longer budgeting the federal funds. Was this dish, dish P? Yes, so this, these federal funds were related to the waiver that ended um, on 12-31-20. So the, that's, what, that's why that got added into general funds basically? Yes, what I would share with you and it, it's a little confusing to understand, so we could have a separate conversation if you want to. Um, but these expenditures were happening prior to that waiver. And when that waiver was put in place, these, um, these expenditures then got a federal match and the general funds that were budgeted here were then moved to essentially support the IDN project. So the net impact to the department for the IDN project was essentially zero. Um, so now that that waiver has ended and we no longer have contracts with the IDNs, those general funds are essentially moved back to here. So across the budget, it's a net zero, but it, it shows as an increase here. When we get to the Medicaid di division and you see that the IDN account is no longer budgeted, you'll see several million dollars of general funds there that are not being brought forward. Thank you. I was actually, I've already seen the IDN account and I was wondering where all those funds went. So there's yes. most of them are still in that same accounting unit, just moved over to general funds? The, the, I, the funds that you would have seen in that IDN accounting unit that are no longer there have moved back across the department. Most of them are in behavioral health, but there's a small amount that was in public health. Uh, were there any long-term supports and services, Jane? No, I don't think so. I think it was mostly behavioral health. And then we were going to general funds in those other accounts. Is that what you're? 
Yes, yes. So those general funds that were in the IDN account are now sort of back across the department. Okay. Is it possible for you to um, generate a list of the, where those all went? Yes. Is it without too much trouble? Yeah, I'm pretty, uh, I don't know if we have it easily in a spreadsheet, but um, we can give you a general idea. The earnings changed year to year, but we can give you a general idea of where they are. Okay, if it's a problem, don't worry about it. I was just, I have to notice that IDM thing because we were so involved with that last time. And yes. I, just, I wonder what happened. There's a lot of money there. Yep, they're back across the department. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? The next uh, accounting unit is 4119, which is Family Mutual Support Services. And there's not much of a change here, just level funding. Twenty-one. Checking to see where we are. We have two more accounting units. So 4120 is the mental health block grant. This is 100% federal funds. Um, so this is um, where I noted that the um, one for substance abuse um, from the federal government is about 7.2 million. And then the one for mental health services is considerably less than that. Um, we did receive in the federal budget um, a 5% increase with it targeted and specified for emergency response. Um, so that will be coming forward. If it hasn't already in this budget, we'll need to bring it in um, throughout these, uh, the legislative process. Okay. And the question on the first, on the previous page. Yes. At two million dollars under grants for public assistance and relief. That was that's something new put in there. What what does that money go for? That's actually being moved from class line 102. That's the um, change that I've talked about where we're moving, where we're budgeting those to uh, better account for the single audit. So the it was previously on 102. That's now down to 170 thousand. And now they're they're on class line seventy four. Thank you. You're welcome. And the last accounting unit is forty one twenty one mental health data collection. What agency is that? <laughs> I'm always curious about where these agency funds come from. Oh. Give me one minute, sorry. Oh, don't, don't worry about it. I thought you might know off the top of your head. Okay. I'm just always curious when I see these, how these funds flow around and where they flow from and to. Oh, that's actually from um, Eagle Technologies. Oh, that's right. This, it, Kaji, do you want to take the first stab at explaining that one? No, it's okay. You don't need to. <laughs> okay. It's a little confusing. It took me some time to understand exactly it is federal funding that comes through a third party source is the way I would just. Yes, that's that's a nice simple way. Thank you. Thank you. So that um, concludes the accounting units for behavioral health. Great. Is there anything else we were scheduled to do this today hey, to bail out, have Jess come back a day late, a moment later and say, where are you? So um, thank you, Mr. Chair and um, members of the committee. Um, we are, as I said, in, um, indicated earlier, we are working to provide the information that's already been requested. Then we'll work through Karen to get that to you and we'll add the additional requests um, made today. Awesome, thank you very much, Katya and Karen and Julianne, is that right? <laughs> Is that it, guys, or what? What, Kevin? What do I do? <laughs> Come off mute. <laughs> yep, I think that's it. You don't have anything else scheduled for today, so you can uh, join the meeting if, meeting if you'd like. Representatives, anybody else have any questions or thoughts or anything there? No, all silent. Even Ken's silent. Okay, I guess we'll adjourn then. Thank you all. We'll see you at ten thirty on Friday. Okay, Thanks. see you then. <laughs>